Okay, folks, good morning. We'd like to start off by wishing everyone a happy Donate Life Month, happy Passover, and happy Easter. Welcome to TRIO Maryland's April Zoom meeting. It's great to see everyone. I'm Marty Marin, and this is my wife, Michelle, and we manage TRIO Maryland. We'd like to welcome all our members and guests today, and thank you for attending. Today's topic is post-transplant dermatology. It is so appropriate to keep us safe and getting ready for the summer. We are glad you could join us. There will be no speaker in May. We will see you in June. And in June, we will be learning about nutrition and transplant, other great topics for all of us. And now I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Michelle to introduce our speakers today. Good morning, good to see everybody. So today's guest speaker is Dr. Manisha Loss. She, Dr. Loss is an associate professor of dermatology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, a dermatologist who focuses on organ transplant recipients. Dr. Loss launched the Mid-Atlantic's first program solely dedicated to the care of transplant patients, all you guys. Since skin cancer is the most common malignancy after transplantation, the goal of the program is to be proactive in the prevention and early treatment of the disease. Dr. Loss has also authored numerous articles and book chapters on general dermatology. Her clinical interests also include gen general medical dermatology, skin cancer diagnosis and management, and resident student education. We're also very lucky to have a second guest speaker, Dr. Leora Aisman. She's currently working as a dermatology resident physician at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Aisman grew up in Bergen County, New Jersey and received her medical education at the George Washington University School of Medicine, followed by a clinical research fellowship in cutaneous oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. While in Philadelphia, Dr. Aisman met many transplant survivors at Penn's high risk skin cancer clinic. She has worked with Gift of Life Howie's House and TRIO Philadelphia to provide skin cancer education to the transplant community. Dr. Aisman is dedicated to delivering exceptional care to transplant patients under the guidance of Dr. Bybee and Dr. Loss, both of whom are at Johns Hopkins Hospital. We're so lucky to have a returning favorite dermatologist expert in Dr. Loss, and we welcome Dr. Aisman to Baltimore and to TRIO, Maryland. Thank you for working together to educate us today, and thanks for presenting to our group and I now will turn the program over to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Marty. It's wonderful to be back. I wish I had invited my mom to hear your accolades and in my introduction. Um, it's wonderful to, to see you all virtually. It's been some time since I've been able to join you all. I'm gonna pull up my talk and just for a little bit of housekeeping, everyone seeing my slides? Yep. Um, Yep. Leora and I are going to try, I'm going to do the bulk of the talking and she's going to try and keep up with any questions in the chat so that we can address things as they come up. But my, my goal and hope is to talk for about 30, 40 minutes and then leave a good bit of time towards the end for us to have open discussion and conversation about any topics that maybe piqued your interest or perhaps even anything that I didn't get to cover today. I, I thank Dr. Bybee, who wasn't able to join us today. Um, she and Leora both helped put together the topics that we hope you all will find informative and interesting as we kind of cover the journey of, of being a transplant recipient. My goal today is to kind of cover four major topics um, in varying degrees, I should say. We'll start off by talking a little bit about the medicines that you take um, for your transplant and how that impacts your skin. And then we'll move a little bit into talking about, in general, how those medicines impact your risk for skin infections and ultimately skin cancer. I'd like to spend the bulk of our time towards the end really talking about prevention. One of our goals in starting this program at the institution was to ensure that we focus on 
educating and prevention, given that skin cancer when caught early can truly be treatable. So let's start with the medicines. What do your immunosuppressive medicines do? Clearly we know they prevent your graft rejection, but oftentimes I get a lot of questions, including from my mother when I tell her I'm a transplant dermatologist. She says, do you transplant skin? And I say, well, no, mom, not transplanting skin. But the connection between your immune system, many people think of their immune systems as sole job is preventing infection. But really our immune system functions to prevent anything in our body that shouldn't be there. And that includes cells that go bad or cells that become cancerous. So really when you take some of these medicines that prevent graft rejection or organ rejection, Doing that suppresses the ability for your immune system to prevent infection and really increases your risk of skin cancer, specifically skin cancer, because UV light is damaging our skin cells throughout our lifetime. And one of the functions of our immune system is to get rid of those cells. And if we handcuff our immune system from its ability to do that, it puts us at risk for developing skin cancer. People often ask, do the medicines themselves make me more susceptible to skin cancer? Many of you all may have taken a medicine called doxycycline, it's an antibiotic. Medicines like doxycycline actually make your skin more prone to sun burning. The bulk of the medicines that we use for preventing graft rejection or organ rejection don't actually make you more susceptible to sun burns. Really what they do are handicap the ability for your immune system to fight off the cancer cells with the exception of one drug. And the one drug is an oldie. It's been around for a long time. And many of you all, if you had your transplants probably greater than 20 years ago, might know of a medicine called azathioprine or Imuran. Imuran and cyclosporin were two of the original um, organ prevention, graft rejection drugs that were used. And azathioprine was found probably about a decade ago to actually make people more prone to sunburn. So that is unique compared to some of these other drugs that you all are probably a little bit more familiar with. Each of these drugs have other side effects. They can cause acne, they can increase the size of the oil glands in your skin. These are not related to infection or necessarily to skin cancer all with the exception of azathioprine, which is the one that I would call out as making you more prone to sunburning. I'm gonna move on now that we have kind of a basic understanding of the medicines in general and how they impact our, can impact our skin. And I'm gonna talk about two types of infections specifically that I think impact our, our transplant population the most. And that's viral infections in the skin, um, specifically warts. I should have warned everyone before. I'm a dermatologist and we like to show a lot of pictures and we like to, we've got pictures of everything. Um, and you know, I, I tell folks all the time when we, when we talk about general dermatology, you meet a lot of seven, eight year olds and they have little warts on their fingers and they have warts on their elbows and everyone likes to pick at them. When your body's immune system can't keep the virus Warts are caused by an HPV virus that lives ubiquitously in the environment. When your body's immune system can't get rid of the virus, the virus has a chance to procreate and replicate and grow in our skin. And it can become quite debilitating to people because the warts can take over portions of our skin that are bearing weight. And so it becomes uncomfortable. On the hands and the arms, it can be disfiguring because they can be quite noticeable. The other virus that many may know, hopefully you haven't experienced yourself, um, is the shingles virus. So a little bit of background on shingles. Shingles is the same virus um, caused by the same virus that causes chicken pox. So in our younger days, depending on what year you were born, if you were born before the, the varicella vaccine came out, when folks got chicken pox, that virus would go to sleep in the root of their nerves. And so you would have a standard case of chicken pox, usually itchy all over the body, head to toe, could even affect the mouth. And then your body's immune system would fight it off and the virus would go dormant. It would fall asleep in the, in the basically in your spine. And then as we grew up to be adults, 
our immune system's ability to hold things at bay wanes as we as we mature, as we age. And so that virus has an opportunity to crawl out of the nerve ending and cause a rash, typically in a distribution of where that, that sensory nerve innervates the skin. And that is what we call shingles. So same virus that caused chicken pox when we were a kid is what causes shingles as an adult. I bring this, this particular infection up because when I first came to Hopkins, there were two vaccines available for shingles. They were not recommended for transplant patients at the time because one of the vaccines was actually a live virus. Since that time, that vaccine is no longer recommended and only what we call the attenuated virus is now on the market. It is now recommended that everyone receive this vaccine. And so I bring it up just for that purpose to remind folks. I know the transplant team at Hopkins um, sent out an email to remind folks or sent out a MyChart message to remind folks to think about getting the vaccine if they qualify for it. I bring this topic up for the sole fact that just like the picture of the warts where somebody goes from having one or two spots or one or two lesions to many lesions, in, in organ transplant patients, when your immune system can't keep the virus in check, it can't keep it in that one area where the nerve distributes, the virus can get back into your bloodstream and kind of spread all over the body and present again like chickenpox in an adult. So this was a lovely patient that I cared for years ago who came in for a regular checkup. He felt great, didn't think anything was wrong. And I, as I was doing his skin cancer screening, I noticed these little, pretty subtle, but these little scab-like areas on his scalp. And if you looked really closely, right, on dark skin, it's pretty tough to sometimes see pink or to see red, but you could find these tiny little blisters, these scabs in other areas. And if you looked a little bit more closely, there were other areas that were scabbed, thought that maybe they were just pimples, right? When you take prednisone, sometimes you're prone to getting a pimple here or there, but really these spots were blisters and the fluid in that blister carried the virus that causes chicken pox and ultimately shingles. And so this patient had a disseminated case or a full-blown case of the chicken pox virus, but started originally as shingles and then just became more than just the, the one area on the body. I'm gonna pause there um, and hopefully, I don't think I'm seeing anything in the chat. I'm gonna move on. That was just a brief introduction to infections that can be a little bit more common that I wanted to raise awareness about um, in folks that are immunocompromised and move on to skin cancers. Couple of things about skin cancers when, when we talk to patients that are immunocompromised. The spectrum can be quite broad. And as I look at the folks in the audience here and know some of you all have for many years, for some patients, this is a minor problem. They might get one or two skin cancers. They may, might get one or two over the course of a decade. But for others, they can get one or two skin cancers every two to three months. And it can become a burdensome challenge for those patients. And, and the truth is, some of these cancers, because the immune system is not in check, can, can truly cause death in, in patients um, because they can be more aggressive. Michelle mentioned this when she introduced us, um, Leora and I, at the beginning of the conversation. But compared to the general population, cancer is two times more likely in transplant patients, and that is any cancer, general cancers. And again, that really gets back to what we talked about with regards to the role of the immune system and helping repair and kill off any cell that goes bad on you. But when it comes to skin cancer, particularly non-melanoma skin cancer, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the definition of that. That's really for you all basal cells and squamous cells. That type of skin cancer can be 13 times more likely and really, at the end of the day, skin cancer becomes the most common malignancy after transplantation. In the general US population, the lifetime risk of developing a skin cancer, for if we looked at a population of folks that lived in the United States, um, at the age of 70, one in five patients would have skin cancer. 
If we look at the transplant population, the lifetime risk of developing skin cancer in white patients, so in Caucasian patients, is 50%. I will tell you, because I had some help in making these slides from a very creative colleague of mine, she always made the woman the one in red, the one with the dress on. I don't want you to think that women are more likely to get skin cancers. That's just a product of my presentation. Actually, men get skin cancer a little bit more frequently than women, even in the, in the transplant population. So I don't want you to be deceived by this. This was just a fluke of my presentation. When we look at non-white transplant patients, and myself and a colleague have done a little bit of work to really try to better understand the risk of skin cancer in patients who have brown skin to black skin. So people who don't burn as easily um, and tan quite, quite easily, the risk drops. So it's probably closer to about 6% in non-white transplant patients will develop skin cancer after their organ transplant. The thing to keep in mind and that we have learned over my career and some of my colleagues' career who, who have dedicated clinics is that we know in the non-white transplant population, so brown skin, dark brown skin, that that population sometimes is more likely to have less frequently go to a dermatologist, less likely to get counseling and learn about their risk of skin cancer, um, and we also know that their skin cancers are more likely to occur in areas where the sun don't shine. So what we would consider sun protected areas, armpits, breasts, and groin area. And so it becomes very important as we educate folks and we talk about what their risk in general is, that we make sure that the skin exam really looks at the areas where those patients would have the most risk. Back to my photos. So I always talk, I, I like to include these types of photos because the truth is you all are so vigilant and, and you know wonderful about paying attention to your bodies, listen to your bodies. And if something like this showed up on one of you all, because the fact that you came here on a Saturday morning makes me think that you would pay attention to this, right? If this was growing on you, you would probably go to your doctor and say, I think something is, is going on. These are the obvious ones, right? My goal and my you know, hope as, as we continue to educate both the transplant population and the physicians who care for transplant patients is that you would over time learn how to find things as subtle as this spot right here. Things that maybe look as benign as this little brown freckle over here. And this is somebody's back who has a lot of spots on it, right? A big brown spot down here, but this spot right here is the melanoma. So our goal in time is to really go from patients who develop spots like this that are obvious to finding them when they look like this because they can definitely be a lot more treatable. So let's talk about a little bit again, what does this mean for you all? I mentioned for some people it's a minor problem, for some it can really become a burdensome um, journey for you post-transplant. Couple things that, that we really emphasize to patients. Characteristics of non-melanoma skin cancers, basal cells and squamous cells in, in recipients is that they occur earlier. So if you had not had your transplant, it's possible you wouldn't have gotten your skin cancer for maybe 10 to 12 years later than you might present with it once you become immunosuppressed. I mentioned that it's not uncommon for us to find more than one spot in, in transplant recipients. And oftentimes these lesions grow quicker than they would in somebody whose immune system is trying to fight it off for them. We do also find that for some transplant patients, their skin cancers can be more aggressive, meaning they're more likely to recur even once they've been treated and can also metastasize. And that means spread to other places in the body. Couple things, and, and Michelle and Marty and I were talking about this when, when we kind of met um, before the lecture started. The age at which you're transplanted does influence your risk. And so patients who have had a lot more sun damage and then become immunosuppressed are at higher risk. It's interesting, I generally don't see patients under the age of 18. I'm always willing to see anybody that needs our help. But the truth is those patients haven't had decades of sun damage to their skin yet. And our goal in the younger population is really to educate about preventing the sun damage. 
So agent transplant is a risk factor unique to you all um, that can put you at risk. The time since transplant really correlates to how long you've been immunosuppressed. And one of the most important questions I try to teach our trainees is, depending on why you had your transplant, you might have been immunosuppressed before you got your organ. And that's important information when we're, when we're meeting you for the first time in clinic for us to understand. The classic example that I give is if you had lupus, you might have taken azathioprine or mycophenolate mofletil long before your kidney failed. And you might have been immunosuppressed for 10 years before you got your organ, at which time it may or may not mean you went on more immunosuppression. And then the last item is the level of immunosuppression. People ask me all the time, are certain medicines worse than other medicines? We're starting to learn a little bit about this as, as you know, people are really kind of looking into this from a, from a scientific or a research perspective. We know that three drugs are probably worse than two drugs, probably worse than one drug, and we've been able to prove that. What has been really hard as we study the different types of medicines in different populations is about every 10 to 15 years, a new drug comes out. So at this point, not as many patients take cyclosporin because they take tacrolimus. So it becomes really hard for us to study large populations of people because not as many people are on those drugs for us to compare and contrast them anymore. But at the end of the day, we do think oftentimes more drugs, more immunosuppression likely puts you at higher risk. I'm gonna run through the three most common skin cancers we see, and I'm gonna present them in order of, of um, risk to you all. I'm gonna start with squamous cell skin cancer. Squamous cell skin cancer, is a 60, there's a 65 fold increase for developing squamous cell post transplant. What's interesting is that this is the second most common skin cancer in people who have not had a transplant. And so what we have learned is once we suppress your immune system, there's a flip and squamous cell becomes the most common and basal cell um, becomes the second most common. These typically present, they can be pretty subtle. They're kind of pink. They have a little texture to them. They can have a little bit of scale to them. Over time, they can get thick and waxy and the base of them can get pretty red. They can have pigment or color to them. So oftentimes, depending on what your background skin is, these can have a brown pigment color to them. This is compared to a basal cell. So as I mentioned, in a non-transplant population, Basal cells are the most common skin cancer we see in the population. I often say to patients, basal cells, if you got to pick the type of cancer you were going to get in life, pick this one. It's a nuisance. If you don't treat it, it will make a big sore. That photo that I showed you of those ugly skin cancers and that big spot that was on the gentleman's eyebrow, that was a basal cell. If you don't treat a basal cell over time, it will make a sore in the skin, it will continue to grow both broad and deep. So it can get into bone, it can get into the nerves, but it is less likely to metastasize or go to other places in the body. Our goal is to catch them when they're really small, similar to the second photo I showed where they were so subtle, you could barely see the spot on the woman's lip. If you look really closely here, there's a clear bump with some broken blood vessels in it on the, on the side of this woman's nose. Oftentimes, the presenting symptom for a basal cell is a spot that crusts or bleeds easily. You wake up in the morning, you find a little scab on the side of your nose, you don't think you scratched it, you haven't picked at a pimple, um, but you see a spot that tends to scab real easily. Melanoma is the skin cancer I think that most people think about the most. We educate the general population the most on melanoma. Um, May is Melanoma Awareness Month, and we often see a lot in the public media about it. Melanomas, I, we always show pictures of the brown ugly spots, the ones that meet what we call the A, B, C, D, E criteria. A is asymmetric. B is that it has borders that are irregular. C is that there's color variation within a single spot. D is that the diameter gets bigger than a pencil eraser. And then E really correlates to what we call evolution or evolving spots that are changing over time. 
Melanomas are four times more common in patients who have been immunosuppressed like our organ transplant population. So it is not the most common one that we see, um, but it is one of the more aggressive or deadly skin cancers we can see in patients. So real important for us to educate about it. So I'm going to transition here. We're about 25 minutes in, and I'm going to spend the remainder of our time really talking about what, what we can do kind of as a community and as individuals and, and loved ones um, for our family to, to prevent this. And I start with this concept of, I wasn't sure, and Michelle and Marty and I talked about this, if you haven't received your transplant yet, if you know of people who are waiting to, to receive a transplant, one of the most important things we can do is get a sense of what our risk is before we can become immunosuppressed. One of the roles that I play at our institution oftentimes is to support the tran my transplant colleagues. If they're evaluating a patient or a donor who has ever had a skin cancer, oftentimes we'll meet with those patients to talk about what their risk would be once they become immunosuppressed or what their risk would be if they donated an organ to somebody um, if they have had a skin cancer. So I think it's super important that you talk to your transplant physicians about what, you know, what your risk is and what you can do proactively to try to reduce that risk. You all are here, so you're already getting as much education, I hope, as you can get on what you can do to protect yourself. Um, we're going to talk towards the end about what it means to examine your skin monthly. I often tell women, you know, women are, are advised to do breast exams on a monthly basis to screen for lumps related to breast cancer. I often tell people, pick a day of the, of the month. I do it on, you know, my, my birthday is on the 19th. So on the 19th, pick that day and just look at your body, do your breast exam, check your skin, get in front of a mirror when you get out of the shower and take a look and see if anything catches your eye. This slide right here is what I kind of call my money slide. It has all of our pearls for things to consider when you put on your sunscreen. Now, I often get the question of what sunscreen should I use? And my response, not to be glib, is get the one that you like because you're not gonna put it on your skin if you don't like the way that it feels, if you don't like the way that it smells, if you can't afford it, it's not gonna work if it's in the bottle or if it's on the shelf at the store. I'm gonna go over specifically things that, how to read a label and how to find a sunscreen that meets what we think is important for preventing skin cancer. But at the end of the day, you want one that you like. The second thing I'm gonna point out is most people don't use enough of it. I grew up in Florida and I, I had these strong, you know, memories of watching people on the beach spray on their sunscreen, right? They'd line up their family members and they do a quick spray and all the sunscreen is wafting into the air, right? And they would spray it and then the kids would run into the water but nobody ever even rubbed it in. It doesn't work that way. I'm not a fan of spray sunscreens if you haven't picked up on that. Really, you wanna use about one to two ounces, depending on how big you are, to apply the sunscreen to all of your sun exposed areas. That's about a shot glass size, shot glass and a half even. Depending on whether you're using mineral sunscreens or chemical-based sunscreens, and we'll talk about that in, in a couple of slides, for, for chemical-based sunscreens, you want to put it on about 15 to 30 minutes before you go outside. You don't want to get outside, get your picnic set up, put your beach blanket out, and then start putting on your sunscreen. You want to do it before you leave the house. We talk about reapplying sunscreen after swimming. And if you're, if you're doing sports and if you're getting pretty sweaty, you want to be sure that you, you reapply your sunscreen as the day goes on. Women often ask me about whether or not they're like, oh, my makeup has sunscreen in it. Most women don't cover their face completely in anything. And so I will often say you want your facial moisturizer that you put all over your face to be the base with sunscreen. And then if, you're, if your makeup has sunscreen on it, in it, that's a bonus, that's an extra on top. As we head into spring and summer, I remind people the days are long, the sun is out, which is lovely. You wanna make sunscreen a daily habit for your face and potentially for your forearms and the backs of your hands. So if you walk your dog, if you walk to the mailbox, you run into your neighbor and you chat for 20 minutes outside at the end of your driveway, 
doing this as part of your routine after you bathe in the morning or before you know before you leave the house, putting it on just to be sure you don't get caught off guard. Sun peaks, UVB, we're gonna talk about the different types of UV wavelengths that are, that are out there. UVB, which is what causes sunburn, peaks between 10 and two. So if you're a golfer, a hiker, a walker, a gardener, think about doing that earlier in the day or late in the day when the sun is a little bit lower and you're not as, as much risk for getting a burn. Leora had a wonderful slide that we talked about um, in one of her decks that I wanted to include. And you know, I often tell people to seek shade. You all received the wonderful gift of life so you could go out and spend time with your families and your friends and go to the beach and go to picnics. We do not want to make you a hermit, but there's no harm in seeking shade and being under an umbrella. The thing to keep in mind is that snow, water, and sand reflect sun a lot. So even if you're sitting under the umbrella, your feet, your legs will get some reflected sun off of the, off of the sand. So you just want to be mindful to make sure that you, you cover up those exposed areas. these days, and I don't have any data to show this, that not as many people are using tanning beds. That might just be the circles that I run in. But no tan is a good tan. So tanning beds are an out. So I continue to include this in my talk, even though I don't know many people that do it anymore. But if you all do, speak up and let them know that, that tanning beds still increase our risk of skin cancer. I talked about this and I thought, you know, this was a meaningful number. People ask me all the time about which is the good, you know, which is the good sunscreen, what should I be using? The truth is most of the sunscreens on the market are quite good. The problem is, is we don't use them the way that they were tested in the lab. On average, people only use about 25 to 50% of the amount of sunscreen that is needed to get them to the level of SPF protection that is written on the bottle. So that's why I think thinking about, you know, either a teaspoon per body part or a shot glass, wor shot glass worth of lotion is what you're trying to think about if you're applying it to your whole body. I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about UV light and I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but the reason I think this is important is because as we learn about how to find the right sunscreen for ourselves, there are two main wavelengths of light that impact and impact our skin and put us at risk for skin cancer. And it's UVA and UVB. UVB I alluded to, that is what peaks between 10 and two. It is what causes us to sunburn and it is responsible for the formation of many of our skin cancers, specifically basal cells. Oftentimes we'll ask a patient, well, how many times have you had a sunburn in your life to the point that you blistered? And there's a correlation between people who have had higher numbers of blistering sunburns and the development of basal cells. What we have learned in transplant patients is UVA, which is a, a longer wavelength of light. This wavelength of light will pass through the windows in your car. It will pass through the windows in your home. It is more responsible for aging, wrinkling, freckling of the skin, but the damage that UVA causes in our skin is cumulative. And so over time, it puts us at risk for the development of squamous cells. And this probably correlates to what we've observed with transplant patients who get immunosuppressed later in life have had a lot more cumulative sun exposure and are at greater risk of developing squamous cells. These two things become important because it is what we are looking for when we go to the drugstore to find a product. And I don't know about you all, but I find this daunting. And I'm a dermatologist, I know how to read bottles, but like you walk into the drugstore, there is an entire you know, aisle full of products that are for face and babies and feet and hands and you know different brands and, and so, what I want to break down for us, and then there's the sales, right? Like, so then you, you try to question yourself, like, am I getting something that's not as good because all of it is on sale? I don't know about you guys, but I feel that way when I'm looking at this, you know, at this row. But what becomes super important is being able to read the labels. So a couple of things, and, and if you're interested, the, the FDA actually recently um, has 
issued some new requirements on how we label bottles. And so the FDA actually has some great information on their website on how to read a label and how to understand the difference between UVA protection and UVB protection. But the things to keep in mind is there are two main ingredients. They call them inorganic here. We call them commonly mineral sunscreens. They're made out of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. I mentioned I grew up in Florida. I remember all the surfers growing up that used to have the white streak down their nose because they would take zinc paste, which is quite thick, quite greasy, and they would smear their nose to prevent their noses from sunburning. Those are our mineral-based sunscreens. Inorganic agents are what we call our chemical-based sunscreens. When you pick up a bottle, the back of it is gonna have active ingredients. And the active ingredients will tell you whether or not you're getting a chemical-based sunscreen or a mineral-based sunscreen. So if we look at the active ingredients for this first product, it contains a combination of both. It has titanium dioxide in it, and then it has a few other ingredients in order likely to get its SPF a little bit higher. This product right here has avabenzone, which is a UVA protector um, right here. And then the remainder of the ingredients are what give it the UVB protection. I will highlight that when we look at a sunscreen bottle, and this is um, information from the FDA website, SPF is a measure of how well that sunscreen will prevent you from burning. So it is a measure of how good that product is at blocking UVB. So people have always asked the question, well, does that mean I don't really need a very high sunscreen because it kind of tapers off or it, it levels off as you get to a higher number? The truth is the way these companies can get their, their products to that higher number is they often add ingredients that are better UVA protectors. And so I tell patients, I ask for you all to look for an SPF of at least 30, um, and the higher is likely going to give you better benefit, but it's not a straight line benefit, right? It's going to bring you up a little bit and it's going to taper off. But if you have the opportunity to buy an SPF 50, then I would say go for it. You got to like how it feels. You got to like how the price of it. But if you can do it, you are going to get a little bit more benefit because you will likely over time get a little bit of more UVA protection. The FDA now requires that in order for a sunscreen to say broad spectrum, which is what you'll see on most bottles these days, it has to protect against both UVA and UVB. And that is what you want on your bottle. Some companies will still say UVA slash UVB, and that is, that is also okay. So you are looking either for broad spectrum or UVA plus UVB. Sunscreens can no longer say waterproof or sunblock. Nothing blocks us from the sun other than staying inside. And so this language is, should no longer be on bottles that you buy at the store. And really what sunscreens can do is that they can be water resistant. And this will tell you how much time you can be in the water and still get some protection from that product. I do want to mention in, in the last couple of years, there's been a, a good bit of information in the media about the safety of sunscreens and, and transplant patients ask us about this all the time. The FDA uses a term called GRASI and it means generally recognized as safe and effective. The FDA does say that zinc and titanium dioxide, the two ingredients that are mineral sunscreens, um, can achieve that GRASI status. Jury is somewhat out on the remainder of those sunscreens, and I'm happy to talk in the, in the Q&A at the end a little bit about that. When patients ask me what they should do, if you're somebody who loves being outside and you, you know, any free moment that you have, your job might take you outside, I recommend sun protective clothing, which we're going to talk about, and mineral-based sunscreens because you are putting these products on your skin day in, day out. At which point, I think you really want to think about the long-term impact of these products on your body, the chemicals that we put on our skin. If you are somebody who works indoors and once or twice a month, you go to the beach, once or twice a month, you go to a family picnic, you can probably put any product on your skin, to be quite honest. We, we have not seen 
risk associated with that intermittent use um, of these products. I do want to highlight one thing because oftentimes patients, particularly patients of skin of color, so darker skin patients will say, you know, I don't actually burn in the sun. Do I need to do anything? I think it comes down to, and I have kind of medium brown skin myself. I do not I tan exquisitely easily, I can burn. And so I know the fact that my skin kind of gets that prickly sensation when I'm in the sun means that I am damaging some of the cells in my skin. And so I do think sunscreen does become important. Many of the mineral sunscreens back in the day made you look pasty white. You would put them on and even a, even a Caucasian person would look a little ghostly in them. These companies have done wonderful things to really micronize some of these products to make them more cosmetically appealing. In addition, they have tinted them. So if you're using a mineral-based sunscreen and you find that you look kind of pasty white or ghostly white in them, consider using a tinted sunscreen to kind of help cover some of that up. My last piece that I'll talk about, which which I have been a big proponent of for many years comes down to some protective clothing. And this is, you know, I think balance is important and moderation is important. And, you know, I do want folks to use sunscreen, but I know once you're hot and sweaty outside, it's hard to put more lotion on your skin. I do think that's why many people like to use the spray sunscreens. But one way to avoid having to do that is to wear some protective clothing. Once the garment's on, it's on. Even if you get in the water, what I love about some of these fabrics that, that companies have come out with, you can take off, if you're a man, you can take off the shirt, you can wring it dry really easily and you can put it right back on. You don't have to worry about sensitivities to these products. They're not messy, greasy. Quite honestly, almost every company makes them. If you go to Sam's or Costco, you can buy UPS-based shirts at most commercial places these days. You can buy them on Amazon. What you're looking for when you're trying to find clothing is the designation of UPF. And UPF 50 is the most common um, UV-like protective factor that you will find in clothing. I have found um, there are some detergents that you can buy at the drugstore. So if you have, say, a, a wrap that you love to wear when you go to the beach, you can wash your clothing in some of these um, detergents that will put a little bit of UPF protection factor into your clothing. It basically puts some zinc oxide into your clothing. I always mention a brimmed hat. You know, many, I'll take any hat. My, my favorite is a brimmed hat, but I know not everyone will put on a brimmed hat. Things to keep in mind, if you wear a baseball cap, the baseball cap only protects to about the mid of your nose and does not protect your lower face. So you're, in a man, your temples, your ears, your lower face still needs um, sunscreen on it. It does a wonderful job of protecting your scalp and your forehead. So I'm not opposed to them. I just want people to be aware that we need to be mindful of our ears and the lower portions of our face. A broad brimmed hat will do much to cover the back of your neck and it will also cover your ears much better. So you get a little bit more protection if you're willing to put that on. I did most of my training in North Carolina and I had a, a patient ask me once, he's like, Doc, I always keep my t-shirt on. I think it's okay. If you have one of those like old favorite worn t-shirts that you always go out and you cut the lawn in and you take a flashlight to it and like you basically can see through it, the UV light is getting through that shirt, guys. It's not gonna work for you. So. You really want to consider, you know, what some of these companies have done is they either use a very lightweight um, material that has a very tight weave in the fabric, or they impregnate the fabric with zinc oxide, which helps to reflect the sunlight. So your old white t-shirts won't work. You really have to buy into some of the, the companies that are making um, UPF-based clothing. So I'll end with this um, and just say, you know, the most effective way for us to protect ourselves is sun avoidance. But as I mentioned, I don't want you to be a hermit. I want you to go out and enjoy the world and do all the things that you love to do. Just be smart about it, right? If, you're, if you have to be out between 10 and two, use your sun protection, try to seek shade, wear Marty's hat. Um, it, will, it will in the end really pay off for you.
We are big proponents of some protective clothing. It means there can be no user error. You don't have to worry about how much sunscreen you're putting on. Um, and it's a really safe way to, to go out and enjoy the time, your time outdoors. Sunscreens can get complicated. Find one that is at least an SPF 30 or above. Um, make sure you put enough of it on. Put it on before you leave the house. One mistake that we often see this time of the year is people will put on their bathing suits and then they'll put on their sunscreen. And for some reason, I don't know why, nobody wants to get sunscreen on the fabric. So everyone tries to paint around the straps, right? You paint around your waistband and everybody gets a sunburn right where the elastic is. And so put your sunscreen on and then put your bathing suit on. And then you won't have to worry about your straps moving or your elastic band moving because um, you won't miss any spots. I mentioned earlier, another thing that you can do is pay attention to your own skin. Um, once a month, when you get out of the mirror, take a look at yourself in the mirror. Stand in front of it at when you get out of the shower. Take a look at the back of your legs. Look at what you can on your back. If you live with someone, ask them to help kind of check areas for you. Patients find more skin cancers than doctors. So again, patients find more skin cancers than doctors do. Um, we want you all to you know, keep an eye on what's going on with your skin. You don't have to keep a mole map at home and mark every spot and, and you know, keep that intricate detail. Look for things that look like ugly ducklings to you. If something catches your eye, your eye becomes very accustomed to what is your normal. If you look in the mirror and you're like, hmm, I don't remember that spot being there before, or I don't remember that spot being that big, pay attention to that. So just as a reminder, there's a lot that we can do as a community to really reduce our risk um, of skin cancers and skin infection. Um, you have the ability to, to protect your own skin and to do your skin exams. Um, and bring that information and awareness to your friends and your colleagues and, and come in to see us in the office um, if you have any questions. That was the, the end of my formal presentation. Um, it looks like there's a lot going on in the chat. So I will shift gears here. Let me bring you guys over to the center. Leora, how did we do? I've been busy. I think I hit most of the questions, but if someone put something in the chat that I didn't get to, please um, maybe write it again and we can discuss it openly. Great questions, everyone. Um, I was just I was just answering that last question we had about um, clothing and UPF and um, what determines that protection level. So. Um, from my understanding, usually UPF is determined either um, one by how like tightly woven the fabric is, or there are some uh, fabrics that are coated with a chemical dye that provides UPF. Yeah. So I think just um, and Dr. Lossia, yeah, please jump in if, if you have something to add. I think most uh, I think they say that most fabrics like, you know, the clothes that we're probably wearing today have a pretty low UPF of I think about five. So 20, so only like 20% of light rays will be blocked by the clothing we're wearing. <laughs> someone, someone. someone asked a question and I'm just scrolling through to catch up a little bit here. Um, we talk a lot, I, I belong to a group of dermatologists and transplant physicians who are interested in the care of recipients. And the question always comes up about you know, who, who should I see if I need a dermatologist? Um, folks that have an interest like I have had in my career aren't everywhere in the world. So if you have access to somebody who has an interest in, in transplant patients, then by all means, see one of them. But the truth is, I'm really a general dermatologist who spends a lot of time educating myself and my patients about the risk of skin cancer. So I do think that a general dermatologist most definitely can help screen you for skin cancer, can help answer questions about UV light and you know general information. If, if things are getting away from you, if you're developing a high number of skin cancers or you have a really rare type of skin cancer, 
it might be reasonable to seek out a specialist like myself or someone who has a special interest in a particular type of skin cancer. But I think one of the most important things you can do is just get to a dermatologist. Um, if you live in the Maryland area, there are three of us here, um, all in academic centers that have an interest in, you know, the biology of what happens when you become immunosuppressed. But otherwise, I think just go to a regular dermatologist, make sure they know you're immunocompromised and, and get a skin check. It's just as important. You know, this was this has really been great. And now we can buy the hats, but it's really sometimes hard to inspire people to actually wear the hats. So hopefully others are having better luck with that. I um are there more questions? Does anyone else need anything about the shingles? I saw shingles came up quite a bit. Is everyone satisfied about the, uh, I see Dario and Sharon have a question. You wanna unmute yourself now? Oh, okay, they're just waving, sorry. <laughs> She's showing she off her, her great hat. You put her hat off. Oh, okay, dub me, I didn't figure it out. But um, is everyone satisfied? Is everyone good on the shingles vaccine? About I have getting a question. I have a question about the shingles vaccine. Yes, um, I've never had chicken pox when I was a child and my kids had chicken pox, but I never got it. Do I still need to take shingles shot? Yeah, you know, the recommendation is that you still that you still get the vaccine. So if everyone heard the question, um, Gloria says that she never had full blown chicken pox, but her children had it. Um, and so the question is, does, should somebody like that still get the vaccine? What's interesting, Gloria, is that um, many people have robust immunity against the virus and they never get sick. They don't either get a lot of the rash or they don't feel crummy, but their body has been exposed to the virus, which still means the virus can live within you. And the way we know this is that People that were born, I can't even remember the age ages, but I think in about the early 80s, a vaccine came out for children to prevent varicella. And so kids who got the varicella vaccine for prevention of primary chicken pox, we still see shingles in some of those children. And that's because they were probably exposed to kids in the community who had the chicken pox virus. Because they were vaccinated, they never got sick right? They never got the rash with the blisters and the scabs, mm -hmm. but the virus got into their immune system and lived with them. And so later in life, they do present the shingles. So we would still recommend it in that scenario. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Dr. Loss, I have a question for you. Yes, Marty. When I coach people about transplant living, one of the things I mention is, is every morning when I do my morning routine, I brush my teeth and comb my hair. I put my sunblock on at that time, literally every day around, around 365 days. Does it get to a point where I should watch how much I put on or how often I put it on or is 365 a good policy? You're putting it on once a day to a very small body surface area, right? I imagine you're doing your face, maybe your arms. I do my face, my neck, my hands, and my yep. arms. Yep. And and so, and you're not reapplying, I don't imagine, throughout the day. Most people don't. Um, Only when my wife catches me out in the middle of the afternoon without it. Without it. And so, you know, our, our take is your risk of cancer is higher than the average person. And at this point, we don't actually think there is any risk to using those sunscreens. And so... Okay. We still recommend for people that are in this high risk category, as, such as yourself, that you do it. The alternative is, is worse. And we know we know the data tells us that it's worse. And I'm glad you didn't bring up age at this point. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have some new questions. I'm out 29 years with my kidney transplant. I've had over 100 most surgeries. Any suggestions to help deter future growths? Yeah, you know, there are newer things that we are doing, and somebody higher up in the chain had asked about something called niacinamide or nicotinamide. For people who have had hundreds of skin cancers, 
I have this kind of algorithm that we follow um, to be sure that we're doing everything that we can to, to slow the rate down. We talked this meeting about prevention. In, in the office, I will often talk about what we call field therapy. So there are creams and potions I can give people to treat large swaths of sun damaged skin to try and prevent skin cancers. We can make changes to the immunosuppressive regimens that you're taking. We often work with your transplant doctors to say, well, which medicines are you taking? If you're taking azathioprine, maybe it's time to change that to something else that reduces your risk of skin cancer. Maybe you can reduce the dose of the medicines that you're taking to help your immune system fight some of these off. And then there are chemo preventative agents. Um, some of them are prescription. Some of them are over the counter like the nicotinamide that somebody mentioned. This, the jury is still out on nicotinamide specifically. Nicotinamide is a B vitamin and it was studied in an Australian population in non-transplant patients and reduced their risk of skin cancer by about 30%. That same study was trialed in transplant patients, but they didn't have enough patients or what we call a power to show that there was a benefit. It didn't show that there was any harm. They just weren't able to show that there was a benefit. So in certain patients that are very high risk, I do offer it to patients and we can talk about the risks and benefits of it. Um, but the data is still, we're still waiting on the data come in, to come in to really support that. But again, there are a multitude of things that we can do, some related to prevention, field therapy, changing immunosuppression, and what we call chemo prevention. You also have some questions, three different questions that are asking about the medications affecting your nails. Does it increase eczema? These are three different questions. And then oily skin uh, yeah. resulting from the meds, those three questions. Yeah, so I'll start first with the nails. You know, nails are an interesting thing. We don't know specifically that the transplant drugs affect your nails. Prednisone, which many transplant patients take, affect everything in your body. Hard to say if it makes your nails more brittle or weak, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, as far as eczema, what's fascinating to me, so eczema, by the way, is a condition where when your skin gets dry, it gets itchy and it makes a rash. Many people get dry skin, but they never itch. So that's just dry skin. But eczema, or the medical term for that, atopic dermatitis, is a, a condition in your, your genetic makeup that when your skin dries out, you get exquisitely itchy. That condition, shockingly, is treated with immunosuppressant drugs. And that means in transplant patients, I don't see that very often because if you have eczema, you're partially treating it with the medicines you're taking to prevent rejection of your, of your organ. So if I do see eczema in you, we pay attention to it because it can be a harbinger of something else going on, um, or it can just mean you have really aggressive disease. And, and oftentimes um, I think of eczema, psoriasis is another condition that I see in some transplant patients where it can break through your immunosuppression and still be present. Any medicine can cause a drug rash. So some of you might have started one of your immunosuppressive drugs, and if you developed a rash, it's possible the transplant team immediately took you off of it. And sometimes the drug rash can look like eczema, but I wouldn't say that the drugs themselves cause the eczema. They actually treat it. Oh, the oil glands. So a couple things. Um, I, I went through this pretty quickly on one of the first slides where we talked about the medicines. The, one of the oldest immunosuppressants around, it's been around for probably 70 years now, cyclosporin. It was the first drug developed to help, you know, the first people undergo organ transplantation, causes significant overgrowth of your oil glands. We, the medical term for that is sebaceous hyperplasia. The next generation of cyclosporin is called tacrolimus or prograph. And many of you all these days probably take tacrolimus. Tacrolimus doesn't cause overgrowth of the oil glands as much as the old school cyclosporin. 
but we have reported in the literature a few patients who started that drug and all of a sudden their, their oil glands blew up on them. So it is possible. It just is not as common as the older generation of that medicine. Let me see what else is coming up. And, and again, if you have a question that we missed as time went on, does CELSEPT increase skin cancer risk? So um, the simple answer is yes. It is actually probably, and CELSEPT um, is the brand name, mycophenolate monclotil, um, is the generic name of it. So MMF might be what's written on some of your, your drug sheets when you come to the office. Cellcept actually, we think, is one of the direct medicines based on how it works um, that can make you more prone to skin cancer. So we think that it, it both suppresses your body's immune system in fighting off skin cancers, but also can play around with some of the genetics of cells and make you a little bit more susceptible to skin cancer. So oftentimes when I meet somebody like the, the person who mentioned they've had hundreds of skin cancers and I call the transplant team and say, I think we need to course correct, um, Cellcept is the drug that we will often reduce um, or even take a patient off of and switch them to something different. Cellcept also, if you were unfortunate to live through um, get COVID, is also directly, right, cell set affects your T cells, one part of your immune system. And your T cells are what helps us fight viruses. So in patients who get extensive warts, um, we often reduce their cell set dose. In patients who got COVID, oftentimes those patients were either taken off temporarily or their cell set doses were reduced because you want your T cells to help fight virus. Someone, uh, Dr. Loss, did ask that, uh, can you use, um, can you layer the two different types of sunscreens and have them be uh, efficient, effective? Yeah, um, you definitely can. Um, there's probably no added benefit and you can probably find a product that has both. So one of the um, labels that I showed you had both chemical and mineral based sunscreen in it. So if you want to minimize how much chemical you use and you, you don't want a pure mineral sunscreen because sometimes cosmetically they're not the easiest to use, find one that has a little bit of both and that way you're minimizing the, the volume of each of them. Um, but they can definitely be layered. Another question that I often get along those lines is, um, what's the order in which you should put your products on? So for women who wear makeup, I tell them it's perfectly fine to put your sunscreen on underneath your makeup. Your makeup's not really going to block or get in the way of the function or the job that the sunscreen is doing. So put your, put your moisturizer with sunscreen on, on the entirety of your skin, include your neck, include your decollege. That's where in women we see a lot of skin cancers pop up because our clothing exposes it more than it does in men. And then put your makeup on. Well, this is, as always, has been great. And um, this is just maybe our personal opinion, but Marty's out 13 years from a liver transplant at Johns Hopkins. And when we first realized that dermatology should be a big piece of his care, we just went to a regular dermatologist. And when we then realized that there were specific transplant dermatologists at Hopkins, we went and transferred over and started going to Dr. Loss. I, you know, the first dermatologist was fine, but I, I just think it takes some additional learning sometimes for the general dermatologist to maybe understand about the drugs and a lot of the things that are really just unique to transplants. So, Maybe it's just our bias, but my personal, uh, I feel better and I feel like we're in just a little bit better hands by going to a transplant dermatologist. And so that's just my opinion. I think it's Marty's opinion. So take that for what you will. Well, this has been great. I uh, thank you very much again for another excellent presentation, Dr. Loss. I hope everybody 
uh, follows your advice and does. I know sometimes it's annoying and it's a pain, but I hope everyone will follow your recommendations to take care of themselves. And I'd like to thank you doctors again for taking your time on a Saturday morning, Easter weekend to help us out. And I wanna thank everyone for attending today. We absolutely love seeing everyone on the screen. And for your information, check out our events pages on our website, website for advanced notices of future meetings. Check out our website at www.triomaryland.org. All of our past meetings are posted to our YouTube channel for your convenience. And we hope everyone has a super holiday and enjoy the spring-like weather. Yeah, go O's, right? Go O's. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Laws. Thank you, Dr. Aisman. You all are welcome. Leora, thanks for your Thank help you. today. We thanks, appreciate everyone. your time.